About 10 years ago, uh, there was an Army unit and a Marine unit that were uh, kind of bumped up against the border of Syria in western Iraq. And the 3rd uh, Armored Cavalry Regiment, 3rd ACR, commanded by Colonel McMaster, was up headquartered around the city of Talafar. The 2nd Marine Regiment was down at Al-Assad Air Base, and uh, between those two organizations, it was basically half of Iraq, the western piece of Iraq, up against the, uh, the Syrian border. That was a very kinetic part of Iraq at that time. And you had an army unit and a marine unit that coordinated very closely with each other and fought a really uh, intense and, and, in my opinion, a successful counterinsurgency campaign because there were two really gifted commanders. One was uh, then Colonel McMaster. The other was uh, Colonel Steve Davis, who commanded the 2nd Marine Regiment. And uh, we would plan things from time to time. We would shift our borders or our, our boundaries between our two units, sometimes as much as 150 kilometers north and south uh, to mess with the enemy. So they never knew where the Bradley vehicles stopped and where the amphibious assault vehicles ended. When, whether they were going to see Marines or Army in their battle zone, they didn't know. And we confused them, and, uh, and we went after an enemy. We found and killed the enemy, and, and as General McMaster would say, in a very righteous way. And it was a, it was, uh, uh, a great pleasure to work with the 3rd ACR. We, we flew out of, uh, out of Iraq, and you got to refuel before you come back to North Carolina. So the plane touched down in a place called Shannon, Ireland which is not a bad place to touch down because they have, they have some great local products in Shannon, Ireland. It comes in a bottle or a can. So we get off the airplane with, with uh, the 2nd Marine Regiment and the, the boss gets his sergeant major and I'm the op, so a few guys together he says, all right, are we gonna let the Marines drink alcohol? They haven't had booze for a year, you know? We don't wanna lose anybody in Shannon, Ireland. Well, we said, but we also don't want to be jerks and, and all, you know. So two beers per man, that's, that's pretty fair. We can manage that. So we let the Marines have two beers per man. And about 20 minutes after we set that policy and the Marines are buying beer for each other, uh, another plane lands and taxis up and it pulls up to the gate and the door pops open and Colonel H.R. McMaster walks out with a bunch of filthy Army soldiers from Talafar. And we started laughing and we're hugging each other like you do when, when you, have your, you see your friends uh, from combat. And uh, Colonel McMaster said, Colonel Davis, man, it's great to see you. Hey, uh, are you letting your Marines drink over there? And we said, yeah, we're letting them have a couple of beers. He goes, how many beers are you letting them have? Well, we said, well, we thought two beers per man. And Colonel McMaster said, XO, tell the soldiers they can have three beers per man. <laughs> So when we're fighting the enemy, we're great. We don't undermine each other or, 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 or make the other guy look bad. But boy, when we get back on neutral territory, it's fair game. But what I learned uh, about that experience is that the man that's about to speak to you is a lot more fun with a pint of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> <Super fun. laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> oh, Chris, th thank you so much, and and uh, and I just want to say, I mean, what a privilege it is to be here, first of all, but what a privilege it is always to be among friends and really family, because you know, I think what we realize. And what all of you realize more than anyone else is that, is that really over time, with shared experiences in our military, you know, military used to become families. And those families are obviously, it's your squad, you know, it's your platoon, but it's beyond that. It's across services, across units. And that bond we felt with the 2nd Marines was real. And it was real because we had all made this common commitment, common commitment to serve our nation to serve really all humanity, fighting the, you know, the evil that we were fighting there at the time in Iraq and that you still see in, in that region today. But really we made this common commitment to each other, you know, and there's nothing stronger than that, that, that bond, you know, and, it's, and for, for all of our Gold Star family members here, you know, your, you know, your, your sons, daughters, brothers, 
you know, sisters, spouses, they, they were part of that kind of family. And I know you feel that. You, you feel that here because of this awesome, awesome uh, event. Uh, and and uh, on, on its 11th year that, that Mike Myatt started. Uh, and, um, and so I, I just can't tell you how, how moved I am. And, you know, Bill and the memory of Tim made me cry earlier, you know. <laughs> and I'm going to try not to in my, in my talk tonight. But, but, uh, but they're tears, you know, they're tears of sorrow, but they're also tears of pride, and that's what, I, what I'd really like to, to talk with you about tonight. So I, first of all, I want to say to Joe Myatt, Wendy, you know, thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege of being back here again. Chris, my old friend, man, thank you so much. And, um, and, and it, it is a tremendous privilege to be, to be with all of you tonight. So I, I thought what I wanted to start with is, you know, quote by a Marine. Now, I, I, just, I should tell you, I mean, I'll, all my mentors are, are Marines, and they go back to the Gulf War. I, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, Myatt, Jenkins, Keyes, Steele. I mean, these are the guys that I've gone to over the years for free, non-binding advice. You know, so, so I want to, I want to thank, I want to thank the Marine Corps and, and and all of you. So I thought, you know, playing to the crowd. You know what I mean here at the Marine Corps Memorial. That, uh, that, that, that I ought to maybe quote, begin with a quotation from E.B. Sledge, you know, who wrote really an extraordinary memoir of brutal combat in, in the Pacific. And in that striking account of his, you know, and his fellow Marines' experience in the Pacific in World War II, he wrote the following. Until the millennium arrives and countries cease trying to enslave others, it will be necessary to accept one's responsibilities, and to be willing to make sacrifices for one's country, as my comrades did, and as your loved ones did. So for those of us who have not experienced your loss, and I would say especially the loss of a, of a child, it is difficult for us to imagine the hardship that attends that sacrifice. Now there's a saying that grief shared as we're sharing here, is, is grief divided. And so I hope that over these three days and over these last 11 years for many of you, you know, that we who are privileged to serve in our Army, our Marine Corps, our Air Force, uh, and our Navy, and our Coast Guard, that we are privileged to serve. We want to share your grief, and we want to help you find comfort and relief. And we pray that fond memories, fond memories and pride Pride associated with your loved one's service will lessen that pain and lessen that sorrow. The words that President Abraham Lincoln wrote to a Boston woman who lost three of her sons during the Civil War, I think capture powerfully, capture powerfully the sentiment to share not only our grief, but also to share our pride. So he wrote, I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only with the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have paid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. So where, while we share and divide our grief, I hope that we mo might also share and magnify, magnify that solemn pride. Pride in selfless sacrifice made in a noble cause, pride in the courage of our fallen heroes, pride in their humaneness, because our fallen soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines were not only warriors, they were also humanitarians. They were humanitarians because humaneness is achieved in the discourse of comradeship. Our fallen servicemen and women were part of teams that took on that quality of a family. Teams in which men and women bound, bound by sacred trust and love, 
are willing to give everything, including their own lives for one another. They were warriors and humanitarians because they fought in Afghanistan and Iraq against those who commit mass murder, torture, enslave people, rape women, and commit the worst kinds of child abuse. They were warriors and humanitarians because they volunteered to serve our nation when our nation was already at war against these enemies of all civilized peoples. They fought on the modern day frontiers between barbarism and civilization. They are warriors and humanitarians still because their memory and example is what fortifies us, fortifies people like me and, and Dan and others who are privileged to conti continue serving. There are wars and humanitarians still because we have work to do. And we will continue this fight and defeat our enemies just as previous de generations of Americans have defeated Nazi fascism, Japanese imperialism, and communist totalitarianism and oppression. oppression. They are warriors and humanitarians still because their courage and their sacrifice sends a clear message not only to us to bolster our will, but also they send a clear message to our enemies. Americans cannot be intimidated. America has soldiers, Marines, airmen, sailors, Coast Guardsmen who will continue the fight until freedom triumphs over oppression. Indeed, victory over Daesh, or the so-called Islamic State, is inevitable because America has men and women like the sons and daughters we honor and remember tonight. Our fallen heroes are warriors and humanitarians still because they made a real difference in real people's lives, earning the abiding gratitude of those they protected from the brutality and murderous acts of our enemies. Today, their memory keeps hope alive, even in the most desperate conditions. I'd like to read from a letter written to our soldiers and families after our regiment, alongside Chris's 2nd Marines and alongside brave Iraqis, liberated the city of Talafa, Iraq in, in 2005. This is a city that had become a base, and you see that brutality now, to become a base for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And the following are the words of the then mayor of that city, Mayor Najm Abdullah Abd al-Jabouri. Last year, my dear friend Najm was appointed as a major general in the Iraqi army, and he's about to lead the offensive to regain control of the city of Mosul from Daesh. So he wrote at the time in 2005 about your sons and daughters, about your fallen heroes. He wrote the following. To the families of those who have given their holy blood for our land, we all bow to you in reverence and to the souls of your loved ones. Their sacrifice was not in vain. They are not dead, but alive, and their souls are hovering around us every second of every minute. They will never be forgotten for giving their precious lives. We see them in every smile of every child and in every flower growing in this land. Let America, their families, and the world be proud of their sacrifice for humanity and for life. Our fallen sons and daughters are warriors and humanitarians still because our military is a living historical community. And we who serve today are determined to preserve the legacy of courage and selfless service that we have inherited from your fallen heroes. They are warriors and humanitarians still because it is not only right to remember our fallen brothers and sisters, their memory is important. It is important to the security of our nation and to all humanity. It is important because remembering their service and sacrifice helps us preserve our ethos as warriors, as humanitarians. And humanity 
needs America, and humanity needs America's warriors more than ever. And the stakes are high today. We know the stakes are high today. The stakes are high because we are engaged today, as previous generations were engaged, against enemies that pose a threat to all civilized peoples. We must defeat these modern-day barbarians like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, who cynically use a perverted interpretation of religion to perpetuate ignorance, to incite hatred, and commit the most heinous crimes against innocents. The stakes are high because battlegrounds overseas are inexorably connected to our own security. We see that. We see that as the Islamic State uses its control of territory to plan and to organize attacks I mean, across the greater Middle East, Africa, Lebanon, Europe, and are attempting to do the same in our own nation. We see connections as these terrorists entice masses of disaffected, naive, you know, impressionable, vulnerable young people, including people from our own and other Western nations, with a sophisticated campaign of propaganda, disinformation, and really brainwashing. We see connections as terrorists, along with the brutal actions of the Assad regime and the support for that regime by the Iranians and the Russians, these proxies, really, of, of, of these two nations that I think are forming, you know, this modern-day axis of Iran, Russia, uh, and Syria, how they've caused the greatest mass migration, the greatest, you know, tragedy, refugee tragedy since World War II. The stakes are high because fewer and fewer Americans understand our military or the wars we're fighting. They don't understand warriors and humanitarians. How many Americans could, for example, even name the three main Taliban groups that we've been fighting for almost 15 years? The stakes are high because popular culture waters down and coarsens our ethos as warriors and humanitarians. Warriors, as you see, you know, are often portrayed as fragile, you know, traumatized human beings. Hollywood tells us little or nothing, really, about the warrior's calling or commitment to his or her fellow warriors or what compels him or her to act courageously and humanely, endure hardships, take risks, make sacrifices. The stakes are high because those who do not understand war or warriors argue that victory over our enemies or winning in war is an old idea that is no longer relevant in today's world. The stakes are high because if society is disconnected from an understanding of war or is unsympathetic to what it means to be a warrior and a humanitarian, it will become increasingly difficult to maintain the fundamental requirements of military effectiveness. As President Obama observed, America has used its military power because we seek a better future for our children and grandchildren. And we believe that their lives will be better if other people's children and grandchildren can live in freedom and prosperity. Warriors and humanitarians. And so tonight, I ask that maybe we resolve to do a few things. To first, share and divide our grief. Second, to share solemn pride. Pride in the sacrifice of those who gave all for our nation, for humanity, and their fellow soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Third, Resolve to always remember our brothers and sisters. And fourth, to honor their memory by preserving our ethos as warriors and humanitarians and strengthening the connection between our military and the citizens in whose name we fight and whose name your sons and daughters made sacrifices. So I'd like to end with a quotation from George Washington's speech to Connecticut troops, this is right before their enlistment ran out during the siege of Boston in 1775. And it was the beginning of a long war. You know, it wasn't looking good, you know, for, 
you know, for the home team uh, in, in America. And I think it's very apt in connection with the service of the fallen heroes that we're here to honor. So, so, so General Washington wrote, I believe that God is a special place uh, for wars and humanitarians who gave their lives for their nation, for their fellow servicemen and women and, and humanity. And so I ask, I ask that God, as Bill had, did earlier today, that God help us, help us today, and all of us, all families of our fallen brothers and sisters under his care, uh, take, take us under his care and protection. That, that God comfort us, that he divide our grief, that he magnify our pride, that he preserve the memory of our fallen heroes and honor their memory by remaining strong, strong as individuals and strong as a nation committed to preserving liberty, freedom, and humanity. So thank you for the great privilege of being with you tonight. I'd like to offer a toast to all of you, to all of our Gold Star families, and thanks to Chris. Uh, my, my glass is charged here. So to all of you, thank you for, for your sacrifice. Thank you for the sacrifice of your sons uh, and your daughters. Thank you for what your families have given for our nation and for all of humanity. Thank you.